Witam Państwa bardzo serdecznie na kolejnym już panelu. Welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Now, a balance of Polish presence in the EU. I uh, am going to have the pleasure of moderating this. My guests are Professor Kryszak, um, Warsaw School of Economics and Schumann Foundation, Tomasz Wroblewski of Warsaw Pres uh, Enterprise Institute, Chair. Mr. Cukiernik, Tomasz Cukiernik, publicist and author, as well as Tomasz Grosse of the University of Warsaw and Professor Czekaj of University of Warsaw. The topic of this discussion is a balance of uh, Polish presence in the EU. It seems to me that the discussion recently started thanks to Mr. Grosse and Krysiak. So let me start with you, gentlemen. I'd like to ask Mr. Krysiak about this balance. Has Poland gained, or to what extent has Poland gained from being in the EU, and could have we gained more? Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Welcome, uh, dear colleagues, panelists, professor, uh, and uh, uh, professor. Um, it's an honor to be with you on this panel. Prof the professor is a distinguished uh, a member, a former member of uh, the uh, Council of Monetary um, Policy. I would like to say that it was a good step to enter the, the European Union from the point of view of the economy was uh, positive. The impact was positive on the economy and the accent that we put with Professor Grosse on the report and the analysis is on the question of the asymmetry of gains, of benefits. This has been over-interpreted in terms of what we showed was a loss, so why should we have uh, joined? But that was not what it was about. This is a challenge for all kinds of experts, professors. It's an invitation to a discussion of this asymmetry but it's not about complaining or blaming ones or the others. It's about asking the question about the economic model of the European Union and how could it be modified in such a direction that uh, these economic potentials of all the member states be closer and closer together. I think that from the point of view of the strength of the European economy and from the point of view of the strength of the European Union uh, in general, from the point of view of the uh, economic model, is very important. On the previous panel, Mr. Roshak carried out an analysis from which we might conclude that it's bad that the Union uh, went away from the Schuman model. All that Schuman said as a wonderful economist and lawyer based on Christian uh, values, although he is no ideologist. I, ideologist. He said um, the union was about interest, about economy, about dominance. But we see the this atomized unit in the form of the European Union. There has been talk of the uh, dominance of Germany, of periphery. From the point of view of uh, people who are experts in a different discipline, I'd like to say that in the area of uh, economics, there is also a visible asymmetry. Now, why should we work on reducing this asymmetry? Well, 
an economy, if we have a big entity like the EU, the strength of the totality of the economy of the EU is as strong as these individual economies of member states. We can't have a strong economy of the EU for no reason. And that is the essence. Every economist knows that if in a space there are entities that dominate, that monopolize, to make things simple, then that's a negative factor for a positive uh, momentum and economic development. Let me add on top of that, I think that is not on the report, but recently I looked into the data of Eurostat concerning the changes in economies, uh, the, the capitals, uh, rather deposits per inhabitant, the value of bonds, uh, shares, and uh, real property. That is, categories um, of tangible assets that are clear and understandable for all citizens, not only economists, because often um, among economists we use more complex models, which is not always transparent and clear to all others. And what uh, do these data show? Well, the data shows that since we entered the EU, and this is not to show you a negative aspect of the economy. I'm quoting this in order to to think about how to shape this model and what can be done about it. If we're talking about countries such as Poland, Romania, Hungary. Bulgaria, this accumulation, this accrual of uh, this uh, capital is around 10,000 euros until 2019. In the case of a German inhabitant, it's 35,000 euros. So that's how much more he uh, saw enter his pocket. In the case of France, it's 32,000. And in the case of the Netherlands, it's 80,000 euros. This is the category that we should be looking at in terms, in the context of convergence, in terms of converging economic potentials. And certainly, if the model continues to function so, we will never catch up with the Germans, French, or Dutch. And this is the right time for me to stop and ask the question, what do we do next? Thank you very much. We'll go to that uh, in a minute. But before, I'd like to ask Professor Czekaj whether you agree with Professor Krysia. Is there really, is that really the, the case? And is it so important? And what's your take on the uh, balance of Polish presence in the EU? Well, in terms of this distance as formulated by Professor uh, Kryszak, um, and this distance between us and uh, Western Europeans, I think it's not up for any discussion, although it is flattening. But at, uh, from the start, we are less developed than Germans, Dutch, and French. They have been accumulating the wealth that they now have for generations and generations when our economy is not free, or the, the, either the state does not exist, or the post-war period were no, not a good time for Poland to accrue wealth. The question is, why is it the case? And what can be done for this distance to be shortened? Shrunk. It cannot be done quickly because that's how these processes work. If we look at the most obvious result of our membership in the EU, 
since 2004 till 2020, let's say, the distance between Poland and the European average in terms of GDP per capita has increased from 54 percent in 2004 it was 54 to 74 we might not yet have uh, the data for 2020 but let's say 76 so it has shrunk by 22 percentage points which is a lot is it thanks to the EU or in spite? Do we benefit from this cooperation with the EU um, and are we catching up? Or is it the other way around? I don't think we can give a definite answer um, for all us to agree upon, but I'd like to draw your attention to this aspect where that I have uh, have done my calculations of financial transfers, and uh, this is not um, this does not mean a final calculation you know, and possible lack of uh, losses flowing from our membership in the EU. But from this uh, strictly financial calculations, my result. Uh, the result that I received is uh, that the it was positive for our wealth. I included four elements, that is subsidies, the difference, foreign trade balance in uh, goods, services, and what's the most controversial, that is the um, balance uh, sheet, or the transfers uh, taking into account the production um, factors, but mainly it's about capital. So among these four elements, three are positive in our, uh, to our benefit. When it comes to the transfers between the Polish and EU budget, there is no uh, conclusion yet, you know. You might look at the website of the Ministry of Finances. There, month by month, up to, down to the single euro, the balance is presented every single month. And we, you know, came to the same amount with the professor. There might be some differences in exchange rates, but you know, it's. Uh, additional 6 billion euros since we joined the EU. That's the bottom line. The second element is foreign trade, and it's the most important one from my point of view. We export, we have exported, or rather between 2004, we have exported goods worth 10.5 trillion zlotys. And imported worth of around 8.7 trillion zlotys worth of goods. For those 17 years, it's 1.7 trillion zlotys. Positive. While the whole balance of foreign trade is negative, and it stands at around 500 billion zlotys. Why? Well, that's because we have a positive um, balance with the EU, but a negative balance with the rest of the world. Where our negative balance is 2.2 trillion zlotys. It's mainly Russia, raw materials, China, and other countries where we import goods from. The third element is the balance of services, and this is difficult to calculate because the main statistical office does not break this down into countries. I suppose it's available somewhere, but you know it's not available in widely available data. So I assumed um, certain. Uh, 
assumption, but the general conclusion is that we have uh, gained in uh, this, we're also positive in this services balance. And the fourth element, the most controversial one, which uh, raises certain doubts, that is transfers mainly for tra transfers from capital Polish investors for um, uh, uh, overseas and overseas capital invested in Poland. So these trans transfers go in both directions. As you can imagine, we have foreign investors in Poland, quite like Polish investors are present in overseas markets as well, but to a lesser extent. Why? Well, because Poland is a relatively little developed country with limited capital resources. If we wanted to balance our investment, foreign investment, with foreign investment in Poland, we would uh, probably need to stop developing for 10 years, more or less, because we would have no savings to finance that. Is that good or bad? That depends on how you look at it, because thanks to foreign investment in Poland, I think it's clear that our economy is completely different than it was in 1990, say. And that's clear. There was no capital, and there were no opportunities for development for Poland without drastic limiting consumption, because we can imagine a fast development of the country, but as a result of drastic limitation of consumption, like in the case of China. China is 50% poorer than uh, Poland, while they have their savings stand at 50% GDP, because the Chinese have to think about educating their children, savings for um, uh, older years, etc. In a democratic country like Poland, such an increase of savings in GDP would be impossible. It does work in China. It used to work in South Korea, Taiwan, and other southeastern Asian countries, but in regime conditions, so to say, with no democracy. In democratic uh, conditions, it is not possible. That's all on my part. I did not make global calculations to say that we gained this or that amount economically because there are so many elements to this equation. I only talk about these uh, pure cash flows, financial flows. Sure, there are certain doubts about some of the data because they're estimates. But I estimated that, bearing in mind that uh, this data might not correspond fully with reality, and if so, so that they are to our disadvantage, so that uh, we, so that it did not boost our benefits. But uh, if we're talking about these financial flows, then the balance was stood at around a trillion nine hundred forty-nine billion zlotys. This is foreign trade mainly, but also EU transfers. Thank you very much. Professor Krishak would like to comment, as I can see, but we'll have time for that later. Professor Grossa, I would like to ask you, as co-author of this report on the balance of Poland's membership in the EU, you mentioned the issue of asymmetry of the European model. Where does that flow from? And secondly, you say that the model operating currently is unsustainable and it's bad for the EU because it's stifling and it will end badly from the point of view of the EU. Above all, thank you very much for having me on the panel. Thank you for the question, too. First of all, I would like to say 
that our analysis was uh, comparative in its character. That is, what was additional compared to previous analyses, or rather rarely presented in previous analyses. That is the presentation of our advantages from um, integration, because uh, the calculations of Professor Kryszak are also positive from the point of view of the benefits to the Polish economy, Polish society, and Poland. Yet, we wanted to present these benefits in combination with the benefits of uh, the, on the part of uh, the Euro Western European countries from operating in the internal market, including the opening of the internal market to the Polish market. And regardless, um, notwithstanding the calculations by Professor Kryszak, I'm sure he's going to supplement uh, his uh, um, his part. I, in my part, present a series of calculations that raise no eyebrows. Because that's how a liberal internal market works. It's normal, stronger entities, that is, Western multinationals, benefit more from the internal market than entities that are weaker. We have to lose that competition uh, naturally. American Chamber of Commerce claims that the benefits of the Polish for the Polish economy are similar to that of the German entities. Sorry, compared to the German ones, are uh, three times smaller. This a similar result is quoted by another foundation. They are three times bigger per capita and six times bigger uh, globally uh, if we compare the benefits for the German economy to the Polish economy. This is where the whole asymmetry stems from. Above all, the European funds were seen as a form of compensation for the weaker states that naturally did not benefit from the internal market. And due to the liberal rules of the European law, they were forced to drop their protective instruments, which were used to protect the smaller entities against the Western multinationals. And that's how the EU works, whether you like it or not. Perhaps the most interesting part from the point of view of our future is, is the ball or the stone in uh, our court. That is, how can we modify that asymmetry? Because there is um, no novelty, if I tell you, that for a dozen years, the economic model, the symbiosis of the Polish economy in the EU and particularly in ties with the German economy as dependent economy, exogenous economy, that is based on an external technology and external decisions as to the future of this economy. So the basic question is, how do we change that? Because, as you were kind to say, even if so far this convergence was rather fast, like Professor Czechai said,
The studies on the part of the institutions, including the EC, uh, show that this convergence is going to be low because costs increase, energy, labor costs on the part of our economy, there are costs uh, connected with the aging of the society. And all this means uh, that this model, based on cheap, low cost and capital, external capital and external and technology, it is impossible to reach the European average, not to mention catching up with Germany. And this is the issue. How do we change the economic model? for it to be based more on uh, national savings, national strategies, uh, in line with our interest. Promoting Polish organizations, Pol Polish technology, and Polish champions. Because otherwise, we cannot develop as fast. One last thing not to drag on, that I'd like to draw your attention to a thing that I do not write on my part of the report. And yet it's very interesting from the point of view of our strategy. That is, what is happening in the EU and what is the European strategy? Well, the European strategy, if we look at uh, what's been happening in the EU for the last months, this strategy is based on four strands, and we should be looking at them, we should be following them, observing them, and adapt to them creatively in negotiation with our Western European partners, and possibly modify. First, it's sharing the cost of uh, stabilization of the Eurozone with other countries, that is, the countries uh, outside the Eurozone. Next generation EU is the best example. The second tendency is that there is a change in direction of transfers from the east to the south of the Eurozone. Financial transfers that are seen as a form of compensation for the opening of the market and the weaker, less competitive markets in the east. So, the cohesion fund, the cohesion policy is limited, while the funds for the south are amplified. Thirdly, mechanisms are bolstered of capital accumulation. That is, referring to what I said before, the natural process of internal market is higher accumulation of capital in Western Europe and smaller in the East. This process has been strengthened in the last months through the project of the Capital Market Union, through services, classical services, like, for example, Polish transport companies in the internal market. And other projects that are much more costly for us and more beneficial for the Western countries. For example, the accumulation of capital means that they will be uh, selling their technology to us. And the fourth thing, namely a French idea, this uh, project of sovereignty and technology, that is in building a technological potential. In France, it's seen as creating French technology and supporting French corporations. So the same question arises. How do we build in these conditions? How do we build change towards an endogenous model based on own technology created by Poland? This project of technological sovereignty could be used. But we would need to win the understanding on the part of our Western partners and explain that we would like to be creators of technology and not only recipients of Western technology. Thank you. Hmm? Professor Krzysiek, shortly, yes, just shortly when it comes to methodology, not to leave you with the impression that Professor Czechai 
finally uh, comes with some numbers and I come with others and we dispute. No. Professor Chekai applied some figures, as he called it, to some transfers, and I focused on, asym on asymmetry. That's why at the beginning I presented what is the final for this asymmetry. So this capital start uh, for per capita in the Western countries was much higher, but I think that it's quite, these figures speak for themselves that uh, because of our presence in the European Union, we capitalize our pockets much slower in the context of what was said by Professor Grosse, that it we were supposed to build our national capital, national assets. And going back to GDP, because professors said something true that the GDP per capita went up. But in uh, the uh, revenue-based method, it comes from the remuneration, from salaries, from the state revenues, from amortization and depreciation. So if um, rev revenues from remuneration, we know the capital uh, gains. This is another thing we don't have any capital in Poland. This capital gains are mostly to businesses, uh, to the Western businesses in the scale of this business is accumulated to value as we calculated and we are uh, quite uh, we agree it's 191 billion so that affects GDP but what comes from capital gains from Polish capital it's not a large sum of money and state revenues and amortization Amortization comes as an element of GDP, which results from capital investment of Western companies. So in amortization, they, they gain some profit from amortization. So the capital that, in, that went to Poland, it was significant. It source our economy, but it's not our own. So at any point, the owner of this capital can take it away from Poland and can, can sell it to some other owner. So that's why I concentrate on this money uh, in monetary categories to show you how much stay uh, stays in our pockets, because that will show the convergence that Professor Grosser um, referred to. So just in short, to sum up, but to have the understanding that we accumulate capital at this pace or another, it doesn't stem from the fact that the European Union doesn't allow us to do so, but that uh, depends on how much capital we generate and how much is left and the rest is uh, reinvested to boost the level of capital. Unfortunately, during the last few years, when it comes to investment, the Polish uh, companies invest less than foreign companies. So here, it's maybe not about taking over, but it's about the growth of companies uh, which are owned by some some for, of, of foreign companies. In the European Union, we should look for some common mechanisms that will allow us to move faster, to modernize faster. Let me give you an example. I don't know if it's relevant to this situation, but for example, caracal, caracals. If we bought caracals, we would buy it with some offset, with some share in the production. That would mean that we grow. So we cannot think that the EU imposes some mechanisms blocking us. Nobody will say no to wind farms in Poland or anything else. It's all in our hands. But we need to know that historically we are in the weaker part of Europe. And we need some effort in order to catch up. And by now, we were quite successful in catching up. 
uh, was two percentage point in GDP every year for 10 or 20 years. But the French would uh, would be willing to get rid of uh, Polish transport companies, of course. I could see that you take notes during this discussion because you frequently refer to uh, the uh, Polish balance sheet. And how do you perceive this balance? Are you positive about it as your four speakers? Yes, that's true. We try to prepare many comparisons and to analyze figures, and I've wrote two books about it. And what's important, I'd like to point out that media that by this report by Professor Gross and Klisiak presented the difference between the transfers from the EU to Poland and from Poland to Union as the balance of Polish membership in the European Union. It's not any balance of our membership. It's just a fraction. It's just an excerpt. And the majority of society took it as something positive. As we pay 1% as a contribution to the European Union for this 17 years, it was about 1% of GDP, uh, and uh, we get 3% of GDP, so net we get 2% of GDP, and that was the message of the whole balance. But let me put it like this. I believe, and of course it's not any balance, and if it is a balance, it's negative. Why? Because the EU funds and subsidies are negative and they are harmful, and I give you some examples of that. First and foremost, the EU subsidies cause expenditures are transferred from the pri public sector to the private sector. So the uh, officer, the officials decide, the public officers decide. Very often EU subsidies, these are um, investments which are not uh, beneficial because, for example, two lanes are, lim are uh, reconstructed into one lane or uh, EU subsidies are spent on wind farm that destabilize the uh, energy system in Poland. The uh, structures built by local governments uh, and co-financed by local governments are so called are so-called endless investments, and these are words of uh, local government officials, because they have to be uh, maintained uh, for from local governments, so they are piggy banks piggy banks investments. This is interference with the market. This is a distortion of market mechanisms. And the market gives possibility of optimal use of resources, and any interference makes this use less effective. And the next thing, these are costs. We need to talk about cost. We have the cost of red tape related to uh, EU funds because we have to hire public officers 
to settle the applications, to collect the applications, analyze them, settle them. The local governments need to hire people to write these applications. They hire external companies, external partners. When I was talking to an expert in EU funds, he said that it happened quite frequently that there were some contests in which the cost of preparation of the applications exceeded the value of allocation. Why? Because there was some amount of money and it was clear that three or four companies or local governments will acquire the allocation, but 100 applications were prepared. So we have to take into account that 96 applications were fruitless. And this is a cost. We need to become aware that EU subsidies are co-financed from the state treasuries, from the state budget. So it's another cost. And the investment financed from EU funds involves some own resources. So we, when it comes to local governments since 2003, as a result of investment, which were co-financed from EU subsidies, the cost uh, increase in endowment level by 23 percent since 2003. Maybe it's not only due to uh, the EU subsidies, but the majority of this phenomenon yeah, is. There is a problem of corruption. Just visit the website of the Central Anti-Corruption Bureau. There are many news about um, some Arresting arrestments that there were some frauds with uh, EU funds and political chantage. We are dependent on EU subsidies, and the politicians are dependent on them in a mental sense, and not uh, and maybe in a political sense as well. So they are dependent on EU subsidies, and uh, due to that fact, they are quite susceptible to the chantage by the European Union, which is uh, not beneficial from the political point of view. And uh, let me give you some other examples. The question is whether this 2% of GDP can have a significant influence on economic growth. It's only 2% of GDP, so these are net subsidies. Uh, the agriculture that acquires the most, as it is said very often, because it gets the majority of dotations of subsidies to the Polish agriculture in relation to the added value generated by agriculture acquired by now for by the end of 2020 since 2004 it got 34 percent of added value this were EU subsidies so what is the effect of that the effect is like this the value the added value of agriculture in in relation to the added value in total went down from 3.7 in 2004 to 3.8 in 2020. So thanks to subsidy, uh, people say that we have all the road infrastructure, any other buildings and uh, structures, and we couldn't have them without the EU subsidies. But in fact, during last, since we joined the European Union in 2004, by the end of 2020, all investments in Poland in relation to GDP this were about 20%. And now let's compare the net subsidy. It's only 2%, so one-tenth of that. But all subsidies are not located to investment. In fact, 
investment from EU subsidies represent only 0.6% of the Polish GDP since 2004 by 2020. In other words, 97% of the value of all investments in Poland for the 17 years didn't come from the European subsidies, 97%. So can we say in this situation that EU subsidies are so significant for the Polish economy and they have only beneficial impact on the Polish economy? It appears that in 2004 we because once again what was the value of investment it appears that for the last 25 years where, when did we see the largest investment in relation to GDP for the last 25 years, so since um, 1986? It was not when we started to um, use EU subsidies, but it was in the year 1998 to 1989 when uh, uh, the investment uh, respond was about represent about 20 percent of the Polish GDP. So never before and never after did we have the similar level. Then this level went down to about 20 percent, and we had some. We have some um, falls, for example, in, the time, in 2020 due to the pandemic because uh, it was 16.6% uh, in 2020. And apart from this year, it, the situation was the worst in 2017. It was 17.5%. Please conclude because we're running out of time. And now, because there is another important thing which is neglected in the discussion. Maybe it was not due to our adhesion to the European Union, but the investment in Poland before entering the European Union were higher, the higher level than after joining the EU. Then we had a negative phenomenon that the public investment after adhesion to the European Union went down uh, and went up in uh, relationship to GDP and uh, private investment went down and that was a negative impact. But going back to the very beginning, so to the balance. You've said about foreign trade, some important export and investment. In my opinion, is export beneficial for Poland? Of course. Is import beneficial for Poland? Of course, yes. Are foreign investments positive for Poland? Of course, yes. Are Polish investments abroad beneficial for Poland? Yes, they're beneficial. That's why I would omit this problem, because this is all beneficial. So, let's calculate. Last sentence. But that's the most important thing now. What are we going to calculate? What's the most important for Poland as a member of the, the European Union? We get an access to over 400 million consumers. And this is out of question. It's not a matter of discussion. It's not like that, that we have to, that we need the European Union because of the EU subsidies. We need an access to over 400 million EU consumers. And this is uh, the uh, point number one of our uh, presence in the European Union. One of high European commissioner uh, calculated that Poland acquires about 10.6% uh, of GDP uh, per year. And this is one side of the equation. And on the other hand, we have the cost of EU the subsidies, the cost of EU regulations, and the cost, there are different calculations telling how much do we lose 
in economic sense and how much the European economy loses because of the EU uh, regulations that is uh, between 4 to 10 percent of GDP. Another thing, energy and climate policy. Probably according to uh, the governmental calculations, we have just started to invest in uh, total transformation of our energy market, and these investments are calculated uh, for 20 years, 1.6 billion uh, PLN. This is uh, about 3.5 GDP every year. So we lose because this is a kind of cost that we don't need. And another thing, this are uh, CO2 emission trading scheme cost. It's about 1.5% of GDP with uh, at the current um, price per ton. Let's put, let's stop here. No, dear editor, let's stop here. No. No, last sentence. Okay, so the loss is in regulations in uh, climate and energy policy that we that uh, became un, uh, harmful for us for three years. Another loss is related to emigration of both abroad. And if we translate it because they all built the wealth of countries they emigrated to, so if we were to uh, calculate it in terms of how much wealth they could generate in Poland if they were hired in Poland, so if we calculated how much Poles uh, uh, generated in the same period, we would have to add another 10% of GDP. Of course, the majority of them emigrated to the European Union. Thank you very much for your take. So that was the last question to editor Wrublewski about your um, evaluation of this. We know that this is uh, not uh, something that could be de explored and analyzed in binary terms, but how do you perceive our presence in the European Union? First and foremost, um, this, are, this is a uh, this is like a vessel with a varying level of fuel. So we joined a different union that we know it today. And we have to remember that. And I'm aware of it because I come directly from Brussels. I work for the Economic and Social Committee. So we develop the opinions uh, to evaluate the activity of the European Union and of the European Commission. And I've been preparing the proposal of the European Commission. And I've been preparing the opinion on the evaluation of consequences of uh, decisions taken by the European Union during the pandemic, the European Commission didn't want to prepare it. They wanted to limit it only to the health issues. And we started to uh, force the larger, the most comprehensive scope of them. So a debate uh, as lasted about 15 hours. And three hours of that time uh, was devoted to one stipulation that we hope that surely um, we will stop financing of workplaces for, from the pr public um, money uh, to the benefit for the uh, for uh, the money coming from the private sector and based on market conditions and for three hours they uh, started to convince me to get rid of this uh, wording uh, private private and free market and for free hours they tried to convince me to replace the free market with some that it should be social pro economic pro development economy and this is the european union um, so when we joined the European Union, uh, such discussion wouldn't take place because I was not in any structure and I was not close that and I couldn't see and I cannot imagine any opponents of the free market at that time because, well, the whole discussions were in the Schumann building. So I couldn't imagine so many people questioning and undermining this and challenging. I mean, I didn't allow them to vote because I would lose 
so because they wouldn't give uh, this opportunity for free market to uh, resurface and to flourish. So we have to take a different perspective. Now we have the perspective of a wealthy country that gained a lot and benefited a lot. And I, of course, I know that we, the main benefit was the access to the um, 400 uh, million uh, consumers, which was quite free and unlimited, an investment that um, generated know-how in Poland and developed Polish uh, enterprises. And now the majority of Polish export, for example, is we owe it to the Polish internal capital, not the external one, which is a great change when it comes to the structure of our export and quite significant ones. So these are subcontractors and uh, this is uh, more and more of Polish companies. So the fact that there are some benefits and the cost and benefits and they are not equal, that may be uh, painful for us. But I'd like to see some point in the past uh, where uh, this uh, was more equal. 500 years ago, 600 years ago, these benefits were always there since the 16th century when the first Dutch appeared here and started to uh, buy Polish uh, cereals. So the benefits were al always larger on the Western side. If we produce in Poland, BMW or Mercedes, and we assemble all parts of it, and it's sold by a German manufacturer of the, and the owner of the brand, the benefit will be always higher, uncomparably, and it's quite obvious. And the fact that we want to catch up the European Union every year we present such a balance in Warsaw Enterprise Institute we show every year how this gap is filled and how it is uh, filled and um, in many countries at different pace because there are some countries that stopped in its development and some not and the concerns I have our, the European Union has changed a lot and it is so far away from the values on which it was funded. And that was the greatest period in the history of Europe, one of the greatest since mid 19th century. And that starts to be a major threat for Poland rather than the, the very idea of money, of support, and of EU funds. Of course, they are, are prone to corruption. They are demoralizing. And I can see, uh, we can see it more drastically on the example of Greece and what happened in Portugal and Spain and Poland. We didn't get to that point, but many sectors, like for example, the training sectors got ruined by EU funds. And I agree with that, but this is only 2%. And and our economic growth and the wealth of Polish economy is somewhere else, and it stems from something totally different. But I'm afraid of all these changes that happened in the European Union. The European Union created from the coal and steel uh, union, it didn't transform, it didn't change. Two thirds of uh, the <coughs> trade balance sheet is in service. And because and the majority of countries, and very important countries, did not ratify that. So we're talking about free market in Europe, but only one third of GDP in the whole European Union is free market. So we stopped at some point, and nobody is interested to expand the European Union. Large European programs, like for example, Fit for 55, which are supposed to which are supposed to generate the European unity. They are anti-European. Not only uh, leaving aside the phobia related to climate change, I'm not an expert in that. But the program 
is focused on Europe. It relates the emission to the emission of CO2 in Europe. But programs are in member states now. Denmark with a surplus of energy from renewables, they do not need to do anything. They have achieved the target. They achieved the full um, carbon neutrality. Denmark, within Fit for 55, is to double the number of the amount of energy generated from renewables. So it constructs an island near Barnholm to construct offshore wind firms, and they will sell energy to us. So they will build um, inequalities resulting from the transfer of finance. Instead of saying that, OK, if Denmark uh, has a surplus, maybe it's a good idea to invest it in renewables in Poland. If Austria, which has one of the cleanest environment, natural environments, wants to invest a few billions of euro in zero emission cars, what for? They do not have any production. They will buy it from Germany. So they will uh, dr be a driving force of the German economy. So a series of these new programs, which are supposed to build the European unity, they boost inequalities, tensions, and problems in the European Union. So. I have a problem with saying how I evaluate the presence of Poland in the European Union because my view is quite positive in terms of where we are and how we function. I think that it's even better for the Estonians or the citizens of, the, of Czechia. Many countries did it better in terms of building its own economy, use of capital, the tax system which uh, is uh, rather wanting in Poland. We didn't use every opportunity we had in Poland. But the European Union that is changing in Poland uh, in generally, and which has been changing towards the EU of redistribution, pro-social, and in the direction of the European Union, which is concerned with strengthening the strongest countries. Many people, it raises concerns of many people. There is a Timothy Schneider's famous book where he's telling about the beginnings of the European Union, dispelling some myths. And he deals with the myth that the European Union was created because everyone was so frightened with the terror of the Second World War. So countries decided to create the European Union to avoid the history to repeat. And but do you see what was done by France and uh, Great Britain? They stopped fighting with uh, Germany and they started to fight in the colonies in Palestine, Palestine, in Libya, in Vietnam, in India. They continued fighting. So they were not disgusted with the idea of fighting because they wanted to keep their empire. So until they understood that they will lose, they created the plan B. So they decided, OK, let's join the EU. And instead of being dying countries like uh, the Great Britain, Germany, and others, let's create one union. Let's use the effect of synergies. And let's build some, let's rebuild our lost power. And this project was highly successful. But now these countries, which became even stronger, they started to play the same game against one another. Because it's not a conflict of Poland with the Western countries. It's a conflict of France against the Great Britain. It's a conflict, conflict of Greece against Germany and France. There are many more such conflicts, and they're quite repetitive. So this is a concern that I have to what extent our presence in the European Union will be beneficial. And another question is, do we have any other option? Because in my opinion, we do not have any. Thank you very much, dear editor. Let's put a full stop here. 
A minute for Mr. Krishak. Right, a minute for me. Based on this balance of asymmetries that we carried out with Professor Grosse, we conclude that if we assume that the access to the Polish market, the resources that we get from the EU budget are an access, then instead of getting 30 billion per year, 30 billion more, that is 60 billion, and then the asymmetry is reduced, so to say, and the number around 535 billion that we quote, which resembles that asymmetry. That's the minimum value that represents this asymmetry. At the same time, the numbers that I quoted, at the same time, this stream has to be fought for thought. It has to raise eyebrows because this per capita values that we quoted is not a good measure because in some countries, uh, this value is very high uh, in some places, and while all around it's uh, the extreme poverty. So we should be using the data of Eurostat and the EU indicators because all is not so good. And the citizen looks uh, in, at what they have in their pocket. And dear editor, it's not about a community, a joint project. If so, the benefits have to be proportionally shared. And what we have in our pocket is the final indicator. Let's have this as a final reflection of this panel. Thank you very much for this interesting discussion. Unfortunately, the time has come to close it. Many thanks to my guests. Zbigniew Kryszak, Warsaw uh, School of Economics, Tomasz Wuklewski, Head of Warsaw Enterprise Institute, Mr. Czekaj, University of Warsaw, to Tomasz Cukiernik, publicist, author, and Tomasz Grosse of University of Warsaw. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Sorry, but it's not University of Warsaw, it's the Economic University in Krakow, which I represent. Right, let's have it as it is. My name is Karol Gatz, and it was my pleasure to host this discussion. Thank you very much.